You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions, a trivia game show meant to teach us more about Black history. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Griot, and currently a Moynihan Public Scholars Fellow at the City College in New York. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about Black history, past and present. So here's how it works. We've got five rounds of questions about us, Black history, the entire diaspora, current events, you name it. And with each round, the questions get a little tougher and the guest has 10 seconds to answer. If they answer correctly, they'll receive one symbolic Black fist and hear this. And if they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we still love them anyway. And after the five trivia questions, there will be a Black bonus round just for fun. And I like to call it Black Lightning. Our guest for this episode is Dr. David Johns, who's the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition, which is a civil rights organization dedicated to the empowerment of the Black LGBTQ plus community that works to end racism, homophobia, bias, and stigma. Dr. Johns has a long history in public service. He was the senior education policy advisor to the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. And President Obama also appointed him the first executive director of the White House Initiative on Education Excellence for African Americans. You may also know Dr. Johns because he's a great friend of the GRIO and is on lots of shows here and there. Hello, David. Thank you so much for joining The Blackest Questions. Are you ready to play? Oh, I don't know, but I'm excited <laughs> to be with you. <laughs> Yay! Listen, you know I would never lead you astray. <laughs> We've known each other a long I'm not, time. I'm competitive AF, so I'm just <laughs> trying to manage my expectations at this moment. Well, my pr- my producers reminded me that Mike Twitty, I think, is the only guest who's gotten a five out of five. So, Mike, if you're listening, we've got someone coming for you. Everybody else, don't worry about it. And we're going to have a blast. OK, so this question, let's jump right in. Question number one. This civil rights activist was a close friend and advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and was the chief organizer of the March on Washington. I which- <laughs> All right. So let me finish, at least for our listeners out there oh, who sorry. aren't on it. But yes, you are correct. It is by arrested. I guess we're going to have to change the rules and see who gets it the fastest now. So, um, so he was the chief organizer of the March on Washington, which was a pivotal turning point in the fight for racial equality. This man was often left out of history books. Who am I describing? Dr. Johns, you say it is? It is our brother, Byron Rustin, who is sitting over my shoulder. That's right. So Byron Rustin was a lifelong believer in peaceful protest and began working to end segregation in the early 1940s. He's credited with helping Dr. King uh, form a deep understanding of nonviolent ideas and tactics. Byron Rustin was openly gay and was forced to take a less public role in activism, despite his effectiveness and decades of experience. In the last years of his life, Rustin became active in the gay rights movement as well. And in 2013, President Obama posthumously awarded Rustin the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And a new movie about Bayard Rustin is introducing the world to even more about the fearless leader. On August 28th, black, white, young, old, rich, working class, poor, will descend on Washington, D.C. You can find it on Netflix. I also narrated an animated lesson about him with the folks from TED Ed, and you can find that on YouTube. None of it would have been possible without the March's chief organizer, a man named Bayard Rustin. One of the things that I appreciate about the film, in addition to seeing parts of my life reflected back um, to me, um, is an an awareness um, and understanding that that moment would not have happened without Bayard's brilliance and his persistence in spite of. Right before that moment, most of our marchers were in the South and they were concentrated in local communities. Uh, he had the audacity to say, let's gather in our nation's capital to make demands of our nation's leaders. And in addition to teaching nonviolent pacifist forms of organizing uh, lessons he learned from around the globe to Dr. King and others, uh, he literally set this stage. Uh, there's so many moments that we hearken back to. Um, when it's Black History Month, when the McDonald's commercials begin to sing our stories or parts of it um, that he created. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. Are there any other gay historical figures you wish got more recognition for their contributions? We know Bayard Rustin is slowly but surely getting his just due. Who else should we be thinking about and advocating for uh, as we learn more about our own Black history? The direct answer to your question is absolutely. NBJC has a resource called Been Here. Um, it's a library inherited from a brother named Stephen Maginald, who 
um, got tired of hearing that people didn't know uh, about the fact that Black, queer, trans, and gender expansive people have always existed. So he created this encyclopedia and we inherited it. It's one of the things that I'm most proud of. And included in that are folks um, like uh, Miss Major, uh, whose book I'm reading now, uh, who is a Black trans leader who was responsible for um, organizing and providing space for Black gender expansive people who've been incarcerated. Um, she's central to a lot of the wins that we associate with the LGBTQIA plus movement. And she's built upon the legacy of Marsha P. Johnson, who's responsible for the Stonewall resistance and things that are often erased when people, particularly white folks, stand on pride stages. Um, I spent a lot of time talking about Byer before now, um, and also will celebrate a contemporary figure in Keith Boykin. Keith Boykin, uh, one of MBJC's founders, he is the first um, Black, openly uh, queer man to serve a sitting president. He laid the foundation for me to, me to be able to serve uh, President Barack Hussein Obama later. He organized the first meeting between a sitting president and Black are not Black, LGBTQIA plus leaders and centered a conversation with President Clinton around HIV. And he continues to leverage his time, talent, and treasures to try and connect dots between how public policy really, really matters in the lives of Black folks and applying an intersectional lens to highlight Fannie Lou Hammer's lesson around the fact that none of us are free and lesson until all of us are free. Um, so that's at benhere.org. Ugh, oh, amen and ashe. Listen, this is why I love having you on, because we've done lots of different types of podcasts and shows together, but you just, not only do you come with it, you come with a succinct three bullet points, boom, here's a That's book, it. here's a resource center, here's a website, let's go. There is no uh -huh. excuse. As you always say, teach the babies. <laughs> Literally, I should have put that shirt on today. I got, we need black teachers because, I mean, they go That's, hand in hand, but yes. We do. And uh, your T-shirt game, we'll get to your T-shirt game later. Just that's a little clue for you. Um, we're going to take a quick break. I'm here with Dr. David Johns. I cannot wait to continue our conversation. Dr. Johns is executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition. We'll be right back. Y'all, come look at what Michael Harriet just posted. Black Twitter, come get your man. It's his podcast episodes for me. I was today years old when I found out Michael Harriet had a podcast. Subscribed. I'm world-famous white peopleologist Michael Harriet, and this is The Griot Daily. That's right. The Black Twitter King has a podcast, The Griot Daily with Michael Harriet, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Griot Black Podcast Network and accessible wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Okay, we're back. I'm with Dr. David Johns, Executive Director of the National Black Justice Coalition. We're playing the Blackest Questions. He's already not only one for one, he's like basically... Uh, you got the question before I even finished the question. So are you ready for question number two since you're uh, hot? No, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. We're coming in hot. Okay. Question number two. Okay. This legendary congressman represented several districts in New York City for more than 50 years. Uh, he was a leading opponent of the South African apartheid, authored the low income tax credit to stimulate the development of affordable housing in urban areas, and was a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Can you name this politician? I should be able to, uh, Charles B. Rangel. That's right. Congressman Charlie Rangel, who yeah. I just adore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we know that Charlie Rangel dropped out of high school to join the U.S. Army during the Korean War, where he was seriously wounded and received a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star. In 1971, his political journey began when he defeated the infamous Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in a historic election. I love hearing that story about how he flew down. Um, and said, hey, I'm running for your seat. And Adam Clayton Powell was like, sure, kid, go ahead. Um, and the rest is history. For the next roughly five decades, Charlie Rangel served on nearly a dozen committees and focused on underserved Black communities, the war on drugs and tax reform. And when Charlie Rangel retired in 2017, he was the second longest serving member of the House of Representatives, oftentimes known as the Lion of Congress. And I know, David, you were a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow in the office of Congressman Rangel. What was that experience like and what are some of the lessons you learned and why did you want to go uh, to Washington, D.C. and join that prestigious fellowship? So prior to this moment, I had been interested in and really preparing to pursue a J.D. Ph.D., to have a life of the mind um, and to really think about how to use law as a vehicle for change. And in this process of responding to these injustices, I founded a student organization, was forced to make demands of the university, Bollinger's and the trustees 
and realize that the law is really a, a lagging indicator for change uh, if it happens at all. It's really much more about preserving precedent. So I found myself teaching elementary school, um, uh, sort of dejected and not appreciating that um, uh, law school was a pathway forward for me. Um, and while I was teaching, um, two things happened. One, I was the only black male classroom teacher in the entire building. Right. Common college. experience. One taught art, one taught PE. And then there were no black boys in my kindergarten grade. And all of these questions I started to ask myself about like how this came to be. Everybody kept saying like, oh, we'll just wait for this policy to be passed and it'll all go away. There was lots of focus on no child left behind. And the short of it is that I took a pay cut um, from teaching in DC um, to move to DC to be a fellow. Um, and, tr and Congressman Charles Rangel uh, and his staff, uh, George Daly was the chief of staff at the time, gave me the room to run, to figure out how people leverage policy or power rather, uh, to influence public policy, to create a literal table while he was on and chaired at the time the Ways and Means Committee, which has powerful tax influence and writing abilities, um, to talk about and carve a space for myself out in the education lane. Um, it was one of the first opportunities I had to watch Black men in positions of power operate and leverage that power. Um, and there's so many lessons that I acquired in the, tip, the time that I was a fellow in his office that I still use to date. Well, I, I think, you know, what is going to be a longstanding legacy of Charlie Rangel will be the number of Black men and women that he has influenced, mentored, not just through the fellows program, but, you know, now that I'm a Moynihan Public Scholar at CUNY, yeah. Uh, yeah. City College, you know, they've got the Charlie Rangel Institute, so they've got their own set of fellows. And I, I'm just, I, I think need, people need to understand the longstanding legacy, not just of policy-wise, but the people that have come through his office, such as yourself, who are continuing to do great work. Ah, oh, I love having you on well, uh, to the, all the shows that I've done. To your point, one, few people appreciate that he's had a longstanding fellowship for folks interested in diplomacy at Howard University. Mm -hmm. which existed well before I was a fellow. And then, fun fact connected to our first question, Charles Rangel uh, challenged and took the seat that was occupied by Adam Clayton Powell. The seats don't belong to members, they belong to the people. And Adam Clayton Powell stood in the way of Brother Bond Rusted and organizing the march on Washington in 63. And he's portrayed brilliantly by Chris Rock in the film that premieres on um, November 3rd. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. Okay, are we ready for question number three? You're hot. Let's go. Okay, you're hot. This actress was the first transgender person to be nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award and is also the first transgender person to appear on the covers of Time Magazine and Cosmopolitan Magazine. Who is she? She is the brilliant, indomitable, also queen of the beehive, Laverne Cox. That's right. I'm going to add stunning in there. We, we were on MSNBC stunning. together. Yes, that's a good and I was yeah. like... Uh, you're stunning. Like, I'm very rarely speechless. I was speechless. So for our listeners out there, Laverne Cox is considered a trailblazer in the transgender community, and she's won numerous awards for her activism. She started her entertainment journey on VH1's reality show, I Want to Work for Diddy, and several hosting gigs on television shows that followed, including her most notable role as Sophia in Orange is the New Black. Laverne is also a twin, and her twin brother played her pre-transitioning Sophia on the hit Netflix show. And during the first season of Orange is the New Black, Laverne was still working as a drag queen in New York City. So, David, I know you have written about this. You've come on so many different Rio shows to educate us and our viewers uh, about the LGBTQ plus community. What do you think needs to change at some of the highest levels, connecting it to some of the work that you did you know, Washington, D.C., as we see so many people within the LGBTQ plus community still under attack, not just in the recent months, but the recent, you know, over the years. And we're talking about everyone from activists to drag queens. And how do we focus, right, on getting people to understand some of the issues and really work as far as coalition building on some of these issues? This year alone, in 2023, uh, we've seen more anti-LGBTQ legislation than at any point in our history. Um, nearly 600 bills have been introduced across um, 42 states in our country. Um, the vast majority of these bills target children <laughs> who didn't ask to be born, and most of them don't identify with these terms that are political in nature, uh, that a lot of adults 
who engage in queer romantic relationships don't even identify with publicly or privately. Um, many of these bills target trans folks um, and they do things like disrupt what should be decisions made between a doctor and their patient or in the case of a child, the patient and their parents um, and, and allow power um, for life-saving and affirming care to be wielded by elected leaders, many of whom never graduated from college, didn't go to medical school, and know little about development or gender um, diversity. Um, and so the last thing as it relates to the burden that our um, trans, non-binary, non-conforming, and otherwise gender expansive siblings face, I hope people hear my heart when I say this. As long as there have been people, we have been beautifully, incredibly diverse. Before the terms lesbian and gay existed, Black people occupied those ways of being. And what we know is that all of us got to get free or none of us are going to be free. And it used to be the case that gay folks, I use the term same gender loving because gay is a white male political identifier. And when people hear gay, they think deviance, they think sex. They think that they're entitled to know how I am engaging in being loved. They don't question if I'm loved. So I use a term that centers that. And I want people to appreciate that right now our trans and gender expansive siblings are being targeted. Black trans women are murdered, are abused. It's being filmed and shared and celebrated at disproportionate rates. This is not to overshadow the fact that Black cis women are missing and murdered and abused as well. And if we're not mindful of the way that intersectionality works, if we're not mindful of the disproportionate ways in which Black trans women are oppressed and then that oppression is erased, we will never get any closer to freedom. And so I want more members of our community to appreciate pronouns and respecting people for how they show up and not feeling entitled to information about other people when you haven't demonstrated that you have a desire to increase your competence or to demonstrate compassion. And all of this is especially true for our trans sibling. Right. So what I love about talking to you is that you can always hold space for many ideas at once. And it's never a competition. And so I, before we move on to question number four, and I'm just so appreciative of you giving your time and intellect to our show today. And I, I wish, I do wish you were a full-time teacher um, because I would audit that class every day, all day. But should we be focusing more on getting more members of the LGBTQ plus community into political leadership? We've seen some great strides with members of the community as heads of organizations, but yeah. should we be focusing a lot more on political leadership? I mean, I'm thinking of Senator yeah. LaFonza Butler right now, who's just appointed uh, the junior senator of the state of California. We're yeah. seeing it here and there. What are your thoughts on that? The answer is yes. And it's always going to be yes if the question is, can we do more to atone for, provide reparations around and otherwise increase access to opportunities for Black folks? Uh, who built this country and so many other countries for free and continue to power them with our ingenuity and creativity. Um, and yes, yeah, specifically with regard to Black, queer, trans, and, and gender expansive elected leaders, what often gets missed in focusing on the political trauma and terrorism is this exchange um, and a failure to appreciate that in the last legislative cycle, we've also elected the most Black LGBTQIA plus elected leaders than we've ever had in this country. The vast majority of them are operating at the local municipal level. Um, and it's really important for us to continue to find ways to create more space for folks like LaFonza Butler, the first openly queer member of that body. I think um, it's 242 years um, of the Senate uh, existing as a chamber. Um, Richie Torres right now is the only um, openly uh, Black uh, queer member in the House of Representatives. He and Mondaire Jones from New York made history last congressional cycle when they became the first openly Black queer members of Congress. Um, and we need to do more. The, the, the footnote here for me is that we also have, I would argue, a, an opportunity and an obligation to create conditions where people feel more comfortable inviting us mm -hmm. in. I keep emphasizing openly because by sheer mathematical limitations, they can't be the first <laughs> uh, right. in terms of <laughs> right on. those ways of experiences. But what we know 
is that there's still more work to be done so that people feel safe, safe. making themselves vulnerable to do that kind of work. Are you ready for question number four? You're three for three. I am. Okay. Question number four. In the last 10 years, this civil rights attorney has become the face of police brutality and wrongful death cases. And St. Thomas University in Miami has renamed its College of Law after him, making it the first law school in the nation to be named after a practicing Black attorney. Can you name this attorney? It is my brother, uh, the beloved, uh, honorable Benjamin C. Crump Esquire. (laughs) That's Benjamin C. Crump. Esquire. So attorney Crump became widely recognized when he represented the family of Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teen who was shot and killed in Florida by a member of the Neighborhood Watch back in 2012. Since then, he's continued to work with the families of victims in high profile cases, including Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, to say just a few of their names. Legendary civil rights activist Al Sharpton has called Crump Black America's attorney general. So Ben Crump says he fights for the voiceless, which is similar to your mission that you all have at the Black Justice, the National Black Justice Coalition. What would you say are some of your biggest hurdles in your organization's fight for equality? I appreciate the question um, and the naming of uh, Ben Crump. Uh, uh, many people might be surprised to learn that Ben is a board member of NBJC, so he's very much directly connected to supporting our mission to end racism and ensure that we all get closer to freedom. Um, what are some of the hurdles? One of the biggest hurdles is that the politics surrounding gender and sexual orientation and gender expression and the policing of those things are controlled by adults who some of us have the ability to vote run for office and otherwise participate in policymaking processes. And I I would argue and my research has shown that too few of us understand how our actions and more often inaction impacts our babies. So Ben Crump is responsible for introducing me to Nigel Shelby, who is a brilliant black boy born in Huntsville, Alabama, who, like me, loved Beyonce, who learned his colors working in his aunt's hair salon, who was a fierce protector of his friends, and who was bullied for being Black and queer with the capital Q. Different. This is before he's able to fully develop, make sense of, and test out possible sexual identities and relationships. His difference was enough of a threat to where not only was he bullied, but when he sought help, the adults around him, including a principal at his school, put on music in response to his cries for help and said, well, Black people love to dance. We don't appreciate that children don't ask to be born. And that for Black youth in particular, the suicide rate for them has doubled Mm -hmm. in the last two decades. MBJC is really honored, very much in part of our work connected to Nigel to have worked with Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, a superpower out of New Jersey, on a commission, um, a Congressional Caucus Commission on Black Youth and Mental Health for this very reason, because for every other community of children, the suicide rates are decreasing. We are figuring out ways to respond to this pernicious and ugly public health crisis for everybody's babies except Black ones. And what I know based on the research that I was forced to acquire myself, because it doesn't exist in the public, is that Black children with multiple marginalized identities, so those who also identify as members of the LGBTQIA plus community with the vast majority of students in schools, identifying as questioning more than anything else. Students who are also fat, extremely black, the kids in my dissertation named toxic stress and colorism as something that is significantly impacting their ability to learn, develop and, and grow. We don't think about 
how difficult it is for them to simply move through the spaces that they're required to move through. They're required to go to schools by law. Often now with teachers who are protected by states who don't want to even say gay while they're trying to question and make sense of this world that we've invited them into. And most of this data is collected before the novel coronavirus. So we haven't even talked about the implications of the fact that kids had to sit with the reality of the lies that we tell them. If you do good in school, you get to go to high school, you go to high school, you do good, you get prom, you get prom, you then get to graduate, you then get to go off to a four-year university. They now know that that shit is a lie. Right. Well, I know that the babies are much better off because they have voices like yours in the dark. Um, Okay, so before I let you out of here, we got one more question before we get to Black Lightning. You ready for a quick question number five? I just, I adore you so much and I could listen to you for hours. I know our our listeners are on the edges of their seat. Okay, really quickly, question number five. This well-known poet and activist is a Columbia University graduate. You know, we're both Columbia University graduates. Uh Who described herself as, quote, Black, lesbian, mother, warrior, and poet. This woman's work is known for its powerful calls for social and racial justice and its raw depiction of the queer experience. Who was this woman? So wait, your first two words were poet and activist? Black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. But she's a well-known poet and activist and a Columbia University graduate. So the the challenge here is that so, I have like, (laughs) um, is this person still living? No. Do I get to, I can't ask a question? (laughs) No, no follow This You got four out of five so far. Come on, baby. This is the last one. You know it. You know this one. You know it. I know you are know they, it. Are they, are they also an anthropologist? I'm not saying anything else. My gut is saying that it's um, Zora Neale Hurston. That's why I'm asking you, she an anthropologist. Uh, but you didn't say anthropologist. You said poet, which, all, which then has me wondering, like, is it someone else? Time is ticking, Dr. Johns. Give me a name. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston. No, it's Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord. Yeah, that was a third. I was one. gonna. I was gonna say I, I, we were gonna give you a question on Zora Neale Hurston, but we had used one previously in another show. So it would have been Audrey Lord. Yep, that's the third one. Audrey Lord was an educator and a poet whose work is used to teach the influence of Black arts. She traveled the world performing spoken word about feminism, gay liberation, and systemic racism. In the late '80s, she lived in Berlin, Germany, for several years and helped spearhead the Afro German movement which empowered Black women in the country to create a community outside of the negative stereotypes of Black Germans. Lord died of breast cancer in 1992, but she left behind an impressive legacy, which includes a community health center in New York City, a gay rights activism nonprofit called the Audre Lorde Project, and she's part of the National LGBTQ Wall of Honor within the Stonewall National Monument, which is the nation's first national monument dedicated to LGBTQ plus rights. So... I know, you know, Audre Lorde dedicated her life to fighting for equality, not only for women, not only for Black women, but for all of those people who just wanted to be free and express their love however they chose. For folks who are like, what can I do? Um, I'm not a policy wonk. I'm not an educator. I would offer three things. One is we should appreciate and respect people's pronouns. Um, Too often I've seen people um, respect people's pronouns when it benefits them and then when somebody doesn't do what they want them to do. They dead name them or they use a name that they know inflicts some form of violence. We gotta be better. Um, and black people know how to respect somebody who's a doctor, who's a, a brother, a sister, a deacon. Um, and so I know that we can do it. Um, I, I, I will us to do it more for the most marginalized amongst us. Second is we can all hold more space for and be better about supporting the development of young people. We often rush to project adult anxieties onto children who are dealing with different shit. And often kids are dealing with stuff sometimes on the way to and from school that would break the average adult. So dealing with our own stuff again by having a good therapist and providing conditions that support them and doing the tough work of figuring all of this out in this moment um, is a second thing that I would argue that all of us can do. Um, And then the third thing is that we should read more and appreciate that so much of what I'm saying is not new. 
Um, Sambufu Some uh, wrote um, A Spirit of Intimacy in, in chapter 13 of that book says, in my village in West Africa, the words lesbian and gay didn't exist, but the word gatekeeper did. I, I connect the dots and remind mm-hmm. folks, you know, we host mm-hmm. space for our native indigenous siblings and they have two spirited as a term and hold revered space for them. So everything began in Africa didn't just skip us. And so we can all do the work of engaging in what my friend CC Battle calls white supremacy rehab or what James Baldwin described as vomiting up um, the worst parts of being black in America or black American uh, to hold more space for how we've always been, how we draw power in relationship to each other and beloved community and how we all get free together by supporting the least of us or those who are most marginalized, minoritized, victimized, whatever the term is um, that describes those of us who are under the weight of what Black feminists refer to as the matrix of domination. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Blackest Questions. We started this podcast to talk about not just what Black writers write about, but how? Well, personally, it's on my bucket list to have one of my books banned. <laughs> I know that's probably bad, but Ooh. I think- Ooh, spicy. <laughs> they were yelling N-word, go home. And I was looking around for the N-word because I knew it couldn't be me because I was a queen. <laughs> but I'm telling people to quit this mentality of identifying ourselves yeah. by our work, to start to live our lives and to redefine the whole concept of how we work and where we work and why we work in the first place. My biggest strength throughout throughout my career has been having incredible mentors and specifically black women. I mean, I've been writing poetry since I was like eight. You know, I've been reading Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and so forth and so on since I was like a little kid. Like the banjo was blackly black, right? Mm-hmm. For many, many, African. many years, yes. everybody knew. Cause sometimes I'm just doing some Sam that <laughs> cause I just <laughs> want to do it. An honor to be here. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Keep shining bright. And we and, and like you said, we gonna keep writing black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. Okay, we're back. I'm with Dr. David Johns from the National Black Justice Coalition. I can't thank you enough for joining us and gracing us with your brilliance. Are you ready for Black Lightning? I am ready, I think. Okay. And do not beat yourself up over that last question. You did an amazing no, I job. Am. <laughs> yeah, I know you are. I, I, I'm going to text you later on tonight, like, hey, baby boo, listen, I didn't oh, mean God to ruin your day. Like, I should have just connected the dots and said, Audrey <laughs> Lord. Um, but you know what? There's someone so who's listening to the podcast. That everybody should go watch. That's why it's on the top of my mind. And someone's listening to this podcast who has never heard of Zora Neale Hurston or Audrey Lord. So you better tell about it for me, friend. Go ahead. You are you're you're introducing folks. Okay, now those of uh, those of us who love Black Lightning, there are no right answers. These are just how you feel, Doctor David Johns. Are you okay. ready? And this is Flash. Just first thing that comes okay. to your head. You ready? I'm ready. Somebody's music catalog has to go. Is it Diana Ross, Whitney Houston, or Mariah Carey? <gasps> oh, you trying to get me caught? I didn't Diana say Ross. these questions were easy. What'd you say? Diana Ross. Tracy Ellis Ross, I love you. Oh, I didn't know that that was going to be the answer. Okay. If you were stranded on an island, who would you want to be stuck with? My partner, Andre. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, Andre. Hey, Andre. What's your favorite time of day? Uh, When the world is quiet, between the hours of like 2 or 1 a.m. and like 4 Mm a.m. Mm-hmm. It feels so special then. Like it's just me and the universe together. All right. Okay. You're about to give a keynote. What music are you playing to get you hyped? It depends on who the audience is. Okay. Um, uh, my go-to when I worked in the White House was often Donny Hathaway's Young, Gifted, and Black, because most mm. people didn't know. Um, but if I'm on my bag right now, it's going to be Victoria Monet or My Mama. <laughs> yes. Okay. I often use the term Mount Rushmore, right? I have my... Mount Rushmore rappers, have my Mount Rushmore, you know, favorite artists, whatever it may be. Who is on your Mount Rushmore or your top four social justice warriors, past or present? Top four social justice warriors, uh, Bayard Rustin, Marsha P. Johnson, Miss Major, 
and James Baldwin. Okay. I think that's solid. All right, last question. Your nails and t-shirt game are always on point. What's your go-to shop when you want to feel good? Oh, so I get all my t-shirts from Stoop and Stank, a Black-owned business. Shout out to my sister. You can find them on IG. Um, And one of my happy places is the spa. I am a Pisces, um, Pisces Aquarius, depending on the calendar. Um, uh, And I appreciate it very much and recharged by water. I talk to the ancestors and I often have loud, vivid conversations with them. Um, and are connected to water. So I really enjoy when I have the opportunity to spend time as well. Uh, well, Dr. David Johns, I want to thank you so much for playing The Blackest Questions with us. I want to thank you so much for sharing your brilliance. And please promise us you'll come back and visit again. I will. We got to do this again. I want to redo. <laughs> we, yes, you want to redo. I want to thank everyone for listening to The Blackest Questions. This show is produced by Sasha Armstrong and Jeffrey Trudeau. And Regina Griffin is our director of podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. You can find more at the Grio Black Podcast Network on the Grio app, the website, and YouTube. I'm Torre. Join us for crazy true stories about stars who I really hung out with, like Snoop, Jay-Z, Prince, Kanye, and the time I got kidnapped by Suge Knight. Don't miss my animated series, Star Stories with Torre, from the Grio Black Podcast Network.